Now, when it comes down to it, you could go all around the internet and find that there's thousands of people um, writing about what it is that you're good at. So whether you're a copywriter, whether you are a, um, a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, it doesn't really matter who you are. There's literally thousands of people out there just like you writing. And when they're writing, they write from their point of view. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd maybe like to do a bit of writing myself, I'd like to be able to write about myself and to be able to share my expertise out there. The first barrier usually is, but there's tons of people already doing it. The issue is, though, not one of those are writing from your experience, your perspective, your point of view. There's only one of you that will be writing about this sort of stuff. So it comes with what your unique perspective you will have, what unique point of view you're going to have. So if you need convincing about whether you need to write about yourself, I'd say that's the number one reason why you should be producing some kind of content, whether it's written or video or audio or anything like that, is that there's only one of you. There's only one of your perspective, one of your opinion, one of your point of view. So what we're going to look at today is a little bit about why it's so hard to write about ourselves. There's a lot of deep down psychology we're going to go. We're not going to go too deep into it, but believe me, there's a bit of psychology going on there that's stopping you from doing it. We'll also look at when you're needing to be writing about yourself, particularly online. There's going to be a, a plethora of different places where you go, oh, yeah, I do need to write about myself there. I know, for instance, as a speaker, I get asked all the time, can you send us your picture in your bio? I'm like, oh, oh, the bio, the bio. Oh, I don't want to write about myself. I don't want to seem like I've got a big head or anything. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But when um, you do have a bio prepared and you've got that together, it's amazing how simple and not scary that process is. We'll look at the three-part formula I use to get it right each time when you're writing about yourself and where online you start to apply this new, more confident version of yourself, this new version that, that presents you as someone worth listening to, someone worth reading about, someone worth seeing a video about. The fact is that as much as we'd like to convince ourselves otherwise, people actually really want to meet us and they actually want to buy our stuff. They just may not know that yet. And the only way they're going to know about that is if they get to know you. If they get to know you, then they've got a chance to like you. And then if they've got a chance to like you, then they've got a chance of actually trusting you to deliver whatever that product or that service is that you're delivering. But if they don't get to know you in the first place, that liking and that trusting will never happen. So people really do want to connect with us. They want to hear our story. It's just that we often think that we're not worth listening to, that our story, our product, our business, ourselves, none of those things are interesting enough or compelling enough for someone to be able to hear it. And the hard fact is that in most cases, we're not ready to present that. And the story we tell is boring. The, what we go into is we go into a pitching and I've got a pitching webinar on tonight, a process on that tonight where we actually go through and learn to pitch. That's completely different to what we're doing here. What we're not doing is try to go here, buy my stuff. Even though we know that they want, us to, to, they want to buy our stuff, we're not just walking up to them straight away and saying, buy my stuff. We're going to learn here of how to weave a story of ourselves into our product or our service. For some of us, um, I've recognized some names on here for some of us. Um, we are the product. We are consultants. We are presenters. We are um, experts in our field and we are the product. So in that case, we're going to weave um, our expertise and our selves, our story about how we became an expert together to form one coherent about us kind of story. For some people, though, it's taking what they sell, what their product or service is, and weaving themselves into that. So when you get the, the fabric at the end, it, it's indistinguishable between you and your product, you and your service, because you're representing them. And there's something which is indelibly part of the story you're telling, because you're telling a story about yourself. This will make a bit more sense sure, shortly. So why are we generally so hesitant to talk about ourselves? Well, a lot of it comes from our childhood, to be honest. It's these sort of scenarios where we're told, you know, children should be seen or not heard. Um, don't talk about yourself. You'll get a big head. Uh, we have this major tall poppy syndrome thing in Australia where if you, you start to stand out, people want to cut you down. If you start to have a voice, people like to come in and troll you. So we've kind of learned in many cases that we'd rather have peace than to be right. 
And that's been a really good excuse for us. Like I get that in my relationships with people, with my dad even. I'd rather just have peace with my dad than to argue with him. So I'll tend to just shut up and just not really have my point of view heard because he's nearly 80 years old. He's not going to change his opinion on anything at this late stage of life. Um, but then in business, though, it's, it then transfers into this hesitancy to stand up to say anything, to introduce ourselves, to be ourselves, our own person, because we've still got, we're still that little kid, that little girl, little boy who was told at five years old, Shh, stop, stop talking about yourself. No one wants to hear that. Um, you know, don't get too confident. Don't get too cocky. So all those things have kind of built up to this point where we're saying, um, I don't actually want to say anything about myself. I'm, I'm too scared to say anything about myself because I'll just get cut down by a grown up or some other person who wants to put me back in my place. And a lot of that is that we have this idea that we have a place to be put into, a place to be put back into. If we poke our head out over the parapet, it'll be shot off. If we, you know, you stick your head above the poppies of the poppy field, you'll get slashed down. So it, it makes us very, very hesitant because perhaps. That's exactly what happened. And it happened a lot in school. In school, you sit in a class all in the same uniform in rows. And if you were the one who dared to ask a question or to say something out of order, you'd be in detention or you'd get trouble. Or if you're old enough, you might have got the cane. So we're being trained and trained to, to not really talk about ourselves. And that British um, stiff upper lip that we seem to have inherited in Australia says, be quiet, be humble, don't brag and blend in. For God's sake, do not stand out. Be as generic and be as humble and be as you know, not noticeable as you possibly can because we don't want to rock the boat. Even, even a lot of the sayings we've got about how we operate in societies, oh, don't rock the boat, don't poke the bear. The very reality is in today's business environment, if you're not rocking the boat and you're not poking the bear, you're not having any impact. You're just another plumber. You're just another writer. You're just another cleaner. You're just another website designer or graphic designer. You're not, or you're just another HR consultant. None of you stand out because there's 50,000 of you and you all look and act the same. I often say to people, um, line up 50 plumbers in a row. And they will all tell you the same thing about themselves. Not one of them will stand out, except when you get to one guy and he's done a little bit of training in this and he actually realizes that he needs to present some kind of point of difference in which to stand out. Because otherwise, the first guy could say what he does and the rest could say, yeah, I do the same as him. Yeah, yeah, I do the same as him as well. Yeah, I do the same as him. But if there's a point of difference, that needs to be woven into some kind of story. It needs to be brought forward so that you do stand out. And that's the reality of business. We can't just be a nondescript shop on the street and expect the people turn up. We need to stand out. Online, we're now not just competing with the main street in our town, we're competing with the entire internet. So if I'm a, let's just say I'm a business consultant or I'm a, a coach, a coach of some sort, like a, like a wellbeing coach, right? I'm not competing against the other wellbeing coaches in Brisbane or Perth or Emerald or Toowoomba, or Mandra, or Darwin, what I'm now doing is competing with wellness coaches in Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, Bangkok, Jakarta, um, Johannesburg. It doesn't matter where it is. We're now competing against everybody. So there's a need to bring forth a bit of a personal brand about yourself. The problem with that is that we get that feeling in our heads, that little voice in our heads that says, who the hell do you think you are? Who do you think you are when, when it comes down to it? You know, do you think you're better than other people? Do you think you deserve to be listened to? Do you believe that you should be standing out above other people? And we get this, what is called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is all about that little voice that tells us, who the hell do you think you are? Why would you write about yourself? That's, uh, that's so, you know, I'm going through this with a friend at the moment who's trying to write about himself um, to promote himself. And he says every time he does it, he feels really stupid because he feels like he's just boasting and that that's somehow bad. And I said, but... That's what you need to do. You need to tell people who are potential customers what you're capable of and why they should choose you. And that is an inherently selfish act you need to do in order to be able to do the very selfless thing of serving a customer. So you have to get a little bit selfish to be a little bit selfless. Imposter syndrome is something which you know, it's very important to deal with in here because this affects so much of the ability for you to write. We'll get onto the formula and the formula is great, but you first need to get out of your own way and to understand what imposter syndrome is, helps you to get yourself out of the way 
so that you can apply a formula and be able to write about yourself much more effectively. I'm just going to mute myself for just a second. I've got a nose full of goop. So what you said. That's better. I'm on week six after COVID and I'm still blowing my nose. So hopefully you don't get it and get that, that long of, of a recovery period. So imposter syndrome presents itself as saying things like you're good at what you do, but you feel like an imposter. You're qualified to do what you do, but you don't feel capable. You have succeeded in life, in business, in academia, but you feel like a failure. People like you, but you feel like you're unlikable. You feel like your entire life and your entire road through business has been just a series of lucky missteps that have happened to land you on your feet and you never really truly were the person who made that happen. And it strips you of your happiness. It strips you of your ability to be able to think good about yourself. And most of all, it creates what we call a false humility. And it really does get in the way of you and your customers. It's not just like a, a cute little thing where people go, oh, she's never going to be the one who's going to take credit for it. She always shares the credit with other people to a point where we go, would you just stop explaining yourself and justifying yourself and just sell me your product or service? And it gets really hard for people to do it. It's just that feeling that anything we do, anything we succeed at can be attributed to luck rather than our own hard work or our own skills or our own qualifications or our own experience that we hand over everything that we've done and they succeeded at and said, that wasn't me. That was, that was luck. That was God. That was Jesus. That was Muhammad. That was Buddha. That was anything else other than me that actually achieved that. Now, the different kinds, and you might recognize yourself in here, and it's important you know this because we can take this into our formula of how to get past all this to produce that formula. The first one is a perfectionist who has very, very high standards of themselves. They have this idea that even the smallest mistakes make them a failure. So, for instance, I'm quite, anyone, there's a couple of people here who follow me on LinkedIn, and I'm almost notorious for typos in my, in my, in my LinkedIn posts. Because I'm kind of doing them all in one go and rushing them through. I'm a terrible proofreader and probably need to get a proofreader to do that for me. But the reality is if it's not perfect, this person can't move on. They, they can't recover from that. They would rather delete that, 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 that post rather than just let it go with what it's actually got. And I've actually kind of had to learn myself as a, as a form of perfectionist that sometimes I just have to let that one go through and just laugh about it in the comments and say, yeah, I spelled it wrong. That's typical of me. Some people actually think I deliberately do typos to get extra engagement of people commenting about the typo. Believe me, I'm not that clever. That's a very clever strategy to do, but I'm not clever enough to do that. There's a superhero, which is that chronic overachiever. I've been guilty of this before. They put in all the long hours. They never take the days off. They're always working and they can never go to anything. But they also have to succeed in every aspect of their life in order to somehow prove that they're the real deal, to somehow prove that they are worthy of people paying them, they're worthy of any sort of praise that people get. They have to overachieve when the reality is they could do a third of that work and they'd still be one of the best performing people in the company. The next one is the natural genius. They've never really had to stretch that far. They've always been able to kind of coast through life because they're just so naturally smart. They're used to things coming easily so that when something is difficult, they go, oh, no, 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 I'm, 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 not, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, um, I've lost my touch, my Midas touch is being taken away from me and not able to do any of this sort of stuff. This natural genius will very much... When the, soon, the, soonest, the soonest barrier that comes up will break them. So if, if you're in this natural genius point and you are thinking, I can't write about myself, you're actually suffering from a lot of shame and self-doubt because you feel like I should be able to do this. I should be able to write about myself. The next one's a soloist. This is um, a little bit me sometimes. Um, not, not a great team player. I try to be very collaborative with people and all that, but when it comes down to it, I've always got this attitude of, look, I'm better off doing it myself because if I leave it to anyone else to do it, it won't get done right and, and, and it'll be a failure. So I might as well just do it myself. We don't like to ask for help. We like to, we like to be able to just get it all done ourselves. But the problem is once we've done that too many times, we realize that when we do need help, that makes us feel like a total failure or a total fraud, a total imposter. So this soloist is someone who then in their writing about themselves, they tend to think, holy crap, I can't write about myself. Um, I need to get help from someone to write about myself. And that's why people like graphic designers, web designers, um, 
copywriters all have such trouble attracting new clients because there's so many clients have been soloists. They've done everything in their life so far all on their own. It's why business small, so many small businesses will fail is because that person has done so much great work up to a point where they haven't needed help. And when they actually get to the point where they need to hire people, no one ever lives up to their standards. So they just go, oh, I'm better off just doing it all myself. I'll just work an extra 10 hours a week and that somehow will make that work. And then there's the expert. They know everything. They're continually seeking out lots of additional certifications and they need to train all the time. They never feel like they never know enough to be truly qualified. Um, This is me through and through. I have so many certifications. I'm doing a cert for a mental health first aid certificate and doing a working with children's course at the moment too because I never ever feel like I'm qualified enough to be able to do what I need to do. Makes for a really good advisor because you've kind of done a lot of stuff so you can advise on it. But the problem is it actually makes you really hard at doing things yourself like writing about yourself. So if you're the person who sits down and goes, I should be able to write about myself and then you can't write about yourself, there's a problem. I've had to overcome this myself recently by getting in a user experience expert to help me out with making my website a lot more friendly for people to use. I've had to bring in someone who will um, review the writing on my website to make sure that I've, I've actually, I don't have blind spots because even though I can write, I can do these things, I do miss things sometimes. I've got blind spots that other people, a second set of eyes can help. Now, to get over all this is a whole other webinar that I could do. But it basically takes a bit of time, a bit of practice and learning to talk to yourself a bit better. Why have I painted all this? Because these are all the things that are making it so hard for you to write about yourself. It's not that you can't write. We we mostly can, unless you have um, specific learning difficulties that make it almost impossible for you to write. There, There has to be something else that gets in the way. And it's usually something to do with this imposter syndrome that's stopping you from writing about yourself in a way that is favorable um, without then spending 13 paragraphs basically talking yourself down before you can talk yourself up. So what we need is something that's going to cut through all of that because um, you probably don't have six months to go and spend on therapists and, and, and counseling and, and getting over imposter syndrome, even though there, there's some easier ways to overcome it. Um, some would say, well, to overcome it, you just start writing um, at the same. That's a, that's a Stephen King approach. You just start writing and then you discipline, you just keep writing and you set up to write you know, something like, a, I think it's like uh, something like 1200 words a day and you will have written a book in six months. So it's a discipline thing that you do. You just go, well, I just have to write about myself. I just have to get over it and write about myself. That might seem easy. But the reality is it can be hard for people. So we then look at why you need to write about yourself. If this, if you can't be convinced that you have to get over yourself and get out of your own way and start to write about yourself, then you need to go, well, at some point I'm going to need to write about myself. And that will be mostly because the world has changed dramatically. This is not the world of our grandparents or even our parents, where, for instance, you can open up a watch shop in the main street and people would know that you were the only watch shop in town. And that's back when the population of Australia hovered around about the, oh, I don't know, probably about 10 million people. Now we've got 26 million. The world was, I remember when the world had 3 billion people when I was a kid and now it's got seven. So it's much more competitive. I remember a time when there was less than 10,000 businesses on Facebook and now there's 17 million plus on there. So it's just this incredibly uh, competitive space. And because the world is smaller because of the internet, we're now stuck in a place where, Every one of us essentially now has to become a marketing business. So if you know Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, he's um, a bit of a motivational guy and, and has grown a, a billion dollar business of his own. He's done very, very well um, with his life. And he's just like basically saying to people and encouraging them to say, you need to now become a marketing or a media business to let yourself be known. And one of those tools in your marketing toolkit is going to be what you write about yourself, how you write about your business, how you write about your products, how you pitch yourself out to people. The reality is, whether we are talking about ourselves or not, people are already talking about us. That sounds a bit scary. It sounds like there's gossip going around, but it's not really what it is. It's in the form of things like reviews, recommendations, and that big one, word of mouth. Everyone wants a bit of word of mouth marketing because they people love word of mouth marketing because it's cheap. It doesn't cost you anything. 
reality is it does cost you a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of repetition and a lot of consistency and sometimes a lot of incentivizing people to talk about you in a nice way. But if you're not talking about yourself, people are already going to be talking about you anyway. Your silence about yourself will say more about you. Quite often when I'm doing um, how to simplify people's social media presences is I'm saying you don't necessarily have to go viral. You don't necessarily have to appeal to a million people to get a customer. What you need to do is just reassure one person who was referred to your, to your social media pages that you are alive and kicking and delivering what they were, what they were recommended. And if you haven't posted on your social media since 2017, then they've got no reason to trust you. Your silence says that you're dead. What your silence says that you're no longer active. Your silence says that nothing's going on. But we've been convinced that in the world of social media and digital platforms that we need to reach the millions in order to reach the one. Now that's sort of been flipped on its head lately where we go, personalization is where we start to reach the one, not through trying to reach the millions. We can put out Facebook ads, Google ads, all those kind of things. But if we haven't got something for people to land on that, or to read that makes sense, that connects them with us, then all that money is wasted. You don't need to have 500 clicks on a link on Facebook to get some sort of success. What you need is, like I said before, that one person who was referred to you as someone who could, could save that, that, that problem they're having, they just need to be able to find you, to be able to know you and then like you and then trust you enough to use you as your, as, as, as your customer. And we also don't have time for people to spend hours telling us about how they're humble. Um, a lot of it's like humble bragging or something goes on. It's like, oh, yeah, I won the Telstra Business Award. But, you know, it was a team effort and it was all very, very, I don't know, very, um, you know, like we're very lucky. I guess it was our turn this year to win it. Honestly, when you hear people going on like that, you realise it's all very fake and all very false and it makes you feel sick because you know that they're just trying to talk it down because they don't want to be seen to have a big head. What I like to see is someone who gets up there and says, Man, we have worked so hard as a team to make this happen. Um, we didn't think we'd make it this year, but we did. And you know what? We deserve it. We've done really hard work. And so to my team and I, I really want to pat ourselves on the back for this because we did bloody good to get this award. That's the speech I want to hear. I don't want to hear the speech of, oh, wow, I never thought we'd ever win this. We're just like a, we're just a small little workshop of three women who just do our thing. And that's just false humility. And it's it's like a little humble brag that, that, it, it sounds so false and so pretentious that it, people don't like, we don't have the time for it. When we're making a decision about who we want to work with, we need to know what you are, who you are, what you do, and how we can connect to that and how you differ to everybody else around you. I want to talk to you about a thing called the mere exposure effect. This is something I heard about at the Belonging Business Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, where a guy was talking about LinkedIn and saying how he um, grew his LinkedIn following from X amount to X amount over a period of six to nine months. And how he works on that as being a, a result of this mere exposure effect. It's, uh, it's a theory that says that we basically develop preferences for those things that we are already familiar with, which is why there's so many people spend money on TV ads, radio ads, Instagram ads, billboards, all those sort of things to become familiar. You do this also through your writing. So we're, we're like about two, three minutes away from actually getting into this writing bit. Where do we do the writing? Why do I do all this background? Because it's important for you to understand that if you are getting in the way of writing yourself, you either need to get over it or you need to learn the importance of why you need to do this and, and how to push through it and what you're up against. Because you're up against a world that's making um, spending millions to get familiar with your customer and you're not. So how do you do that? you're going to be relying upon a lot of personal referrals by people just happening upon you on LinkedIn or happening upon you on Facebook and being referred to you. But if they land on your properties and they do not see a clear picture of who you are based upon what you do and how you can help them, then they will not convert to your customer. No matter how many beautiful photos you have of your sunsets outside your office windows and the lovely photo of you and your team celebrating someone's birthday, what they want to see is you. And you, how you're going to help them. But of course, you're still stuck here. You're stuck in the, I don't like talking about myself. I don't want to brag. That's enough about me. I've talked about myself too much. 
That kind of stuff is just not convincing anyone. We know that you really need to do this. So where you might need to write about yourself is in areas such as websites and your about us section. A good about us section can make the difference between um, between getting a sale and not getting a sale, between getting a person who's going to consider you or they just not consider you at all. The about us section on a lot of um, a lot of development sites, a lot of um, the sites that are working around um, services. So you're selling a service, so you may be the deliverer of that service, comes because uh, it, it's like the second most visited um, page on the site, simply because they get to the home page and they immediately want to know all about you. So if you look at your Google Analytics, um, like I do with my, my about page is, is probably about the fourth most visited page because I've got lots of landing pages, but it's out of the core pages of my site, it's the second most visited after the home page because people want to know who I am and how to connect to me. On the website, your about section, your sales copy, your homepage information, the product pages, your recommendations even, um, team pages, like the, the, the buyers about your teams. These are all areas where you're going to write about yourself. Then there's quotes and proposals that you're sending out. Now, where would that appear? Well, there's always going to be a company profile section about that, the information about who your company is, what you do, and, and what your background is. And often when you're doing quotes for things like um, government grants to work, to work on people who are getting government grants, that will require that you actually have some information, not just about your company, but about who is going to be working on there. So if you're not comfortable writing about yourself and your expertise, they can look at that and reject that because then, man, it's just going to be a mess. Um, Andrew here is saying something about our wellness coach links, and this is the same thing. You'll, you'll write this in terms of you know, the kind of um, stuff you need to write about yourself is going to have to say, well, why should someone work with you apart from the fact that you went, went and got some certificate and, and you like natural living? That's not enough to get someone across. They've got to, again, know who you are and then they'll have a chance to like you, which gives them a chance to trust you to become a customer. LinkedIn is a place where you inherently write about yourself. That is the home of the humble brag. That's, some, that's the home of everybody bragging about themselves and showing off their expertise. But I really enjoy it because I have, I have a very joyful experience of LinkedIn. I, I like the people I follow. They produce really uplifting content and I find it to be a great learning place. But you'll write about yourself in your profile description, in your posts, in any articles you may produce, even live video that you may do on the platform will be the same as well. And the same thing goes for Facebook and all the other kind of social media, writing about yourself in your, pro, in your bio for, um, for Instagram, writing about yourself in your bio on Facebook. All these places are touch points that people could land at that will then have a, an immediate reaction on whether they want to buy into what you're selling or if they just go, eh, I don't really connect with this person. And they don't literally sit there and say that. It's a, it's a, it's a back of their mind, some automatic process they go through. They either connect with you or if they don't. So I always say to people, put a photo of yourself on your resume because every other resume is just going to look the same. But you, if you're the one person who has a photo, it doesn't matter if you're good looking or not, put the photo on there because it immediately gives the person receiving that the chance to connect with you personally. Now, People go, but they should be choosing based on merit. We know damn well that doesn't happen. We know that people make emotional decisions even when they're hiring. If I get a, a thousand resumes and I could get you know 999 of those have all got the same qualifications, but there's one person who has the same qualifications, actually shared their photo and a, and a personal anecdote, I'm so much more likely to lean towards them because they were the different one that stood out. Social media could be your profile description, posts, articles, again, live video where you get to talk about yourself. In this presentation earlier on, I had to talk about myself. I'm using examples from my own life in order to help make those examples come through for you. So a bio for speakers, if you're going to the speaking field, motivational speaking or any of that sort of thing, I do quite a lot of um, uh, instructional speaking. That's one of the things that used to dread me. They'd go, oh, send us your picture in a bio. And I go, oh, pictures are so crap because it's just all selfies. And, you know, so what I had to do is get some professional photos taken because it comes up a lot. The second thing was I had to sit down and just write some bios, buy a long one, a, a full pager, write a short one, which is just a couple of sentences, write, you know, a paragraph long one, be able to succinctly explain why someone would care about hearing me speak at a conference or hearing me speak in a webinar or a workshop. There's got to be a reason because otherwise I'm just going to be any sort of mug punter that's producing a workshop and doesn't even know what they're talking about. 
So the buyer for speaking will have, again, about you, a bit of experience about your past speaking gigs. What you speak about especially is, you know, I don't, I don't speak about women's empowerment because I'm not a woman um, and I'm probably not in the best position to talk about that. What I can speak about is the reaction of men to feminism because I'm a man who has lived through feminism and is a feminist himself and can go, well, I can speak to that successfully. I can be part of that whole thing. So now we get to the actual point where we write. This is the big coon a bit. There's three really main steps to writing about yourself. It starts off with the idea of finding out what you want to achieve. What do you want to actually get at the end of this from whatever blurb you're writing about yourself? If you don't have that goal, think about it. What do you want that writing to do? Do you want that writing to make you feel more relatable? Do you want that writing to make someone want to buy from you? Do you make that writing to make you, them want to inquire more to sort of consider you in the mix of people they want to work with and then consider your target who is going to read this that's going to determine the tone the kind of language you're going to use the kind of approach you'll take any sort of colloquialisms and slang that might come in there as well are you writing to americans well the word optimize and maximize they're going to have a z in them so remembering there's little things like that that are going to come up and then if the structure is how do you start how you fill out the middle bit and how you end it. Remember when we're going through school and learn how to write essays, this is kind of the same thing. Learn how to start, learn how to present your points and then learn how to get out. So many speakers, when they're very new to it, they don't have a plan to go up to how to start to, to how to hook people into what they're about to say, how to very clearly articulate their points and then how to get out in the end. The same thing happens when writing about ourselves. We just go, well, what do I do? Do you just want to like hear about what I've done? Do you want to like get a list of my qualifications? What do you need in there? What they're usually asking for in an about us section or in a social media post or that is tell me a story. Let me get to know you as a person, as a human being, rather than as just a, a resume. We're not writing a resume here. What we're doing is almost presenting ourselves to the world and bringing people in to... I guess, to be interested about us. They've got to be interested about us in order to hear from us. So first, know what you want to achieve at the end of this. Understand who you're writing it for and then give it some sort of structure. And it goes a little bit like this. The objective is, are you trying to sell something? Are you looking to assert your credibility? Are you looking to introduce yourself to a market? Um, a lot of my work on LinkedIn, for those who follow me, is about asserting my credibility. It's about letting people know that this is what I'm good at. This is what I can speak to. This is what I have authority and credibility in. This is what I have experience in. So I'm able to speak to those things. If I started speaking to um, the theory of why modern art uh is, is crap and it's really classical arts are where it's at. I wouldn't know what I'm talking about because I don't, I'm in the arts. I have no credibility. I have no background on that. So a lot of that is just reiterating all the time um, what I know and, and how I can show you that I know it. The second part, which is the target, is it corporate people, government people, parents, consumers, adults, kids? Who is it you're talking to? Because all those things are going to, to tell you the tone with which you're going to approach it with. And like I said, with the structure, understand what the style of the writing is. Is it a resume or a website page? Is it a quote? Is it a response to tender? What is the style of it? It's going to be very, very different. We're going to assume that this is something a little bit more casual than a resume or a quote or a proposal, or at the same time, a quote or a proposal can have a company profile in there that has a little bit of a story as well. Um, it just may take a little longer, or it may be a bit more like a, a, a story of a professional success, like a, a company history that may be different. I'm going to assume here, though, that what we're going to do is pretty much write about ourselves in something like a Facebook profile, um, a LinkedIn a blurb about ourselves, an About Us page on a website, and go with the idea of these three steps being what is the goal, who is the reader, and how am I going to structure this? So the example I'm going to use in this particular time, we're going to go through a few, and we can then go through a few of yours as well if we've got the time, is... In this case, I'm going to go, my goal is to fill out the about page on my website. So the about page on my website, who's going to read that? Well, it's going to be a potential customer of my writing business. Um, I've got a couple of um, <laughs> copywriters actually on this particular webinar. So it's interesting. Um, this is, I didn't know you were going to be on this. So it's uh, an interesting coincidence. But the, um, <coughs> the reader is, 
someone who could potentially become a customer of yours. <clears throat> your structure then is going to be quite friendly and personal. It's going to lead to them want to consider you. It's going to be that whole thing where they come in, they've now heard of you, now they've been able to connect with you, they kind of like you because you're friendly, you're personal, you're approachable. Um, so they're more likely to trust you with what you're about to do with them. So that's it, your goal. Fill out the about page. The reader is a potential customer. The structure is going to be friendly and personal, wanting them to learn more. So what we'll do is we'll go, well, okay, what we need to do as part of that is to showcase our styles of writing. And part of that might be with using our copywriting skills to write our about page. And that's by introducing something about yourself and having some kind of call to action at the end. So we go, let me be a little vulnerable and say, this is where I've come from. Let me show you my professionalism to show you where I am now and now have some kind of call to action. That call to action being basically, this is how you work with me. This is how you'll inquire with me. This is how you can buy it, like a, a buy now or inquire now or book now, one of those buttons. Or it's a statement at the end that says, hey, if you'd like to work with me, please do reach out to me on LinkedIn and they'll reach out to me via email or give me a call, those kind of things. So once we've got that, then we take that, that objective, that those plans we have, and form a story around it. So that story is going to be that we need to start off with something thought-provoking or something that's a bit of a hook. It's a bit of a teaser. It hooks you in, makes you interested in reading more. Then we tell a bit of a story. Now, in the case of this one, it'll be three points or three ideas that we explore in this story about ourselves. And at the end, we get out by concluding what we've just talked about and having some kind of call to action that says, okay, what's next? Almost everything you'll ever do on a website, almost anything you'll ever do on social media has to have a next step. Um, people can be a little dumb. People can be a little um, a little monkey see, monkey do. That's why we've got safety signs everywhere. Now, we'd never know whether we were walking, walking, going left or going right unless someone told us to go left or right. So we need to be told. And at the end of a story, people are quite, they, they're caught up in the story, they're, they're caught up in emotions, quite honestly, and they need to be then told and directed what to do next. So if you just told them a great story about overcoming obstacles to become the person you are today, then you need to go. And it's because of that, that you should give me a call. Now, the example I'll use, again, for our writer, is that thought-provoking teaser. So in this case, it is, um, I'm written, I've written, given my struggles with cursive writing and some very interesting ways to avoid spending any time sitting down, no one could have told you that my writing, that writing would one day be my passion and my career. So we're immediately just bringing it in going, right, okay, we've got some empathy for this person because they struggle with cursive writing. And we all know that person, if we weren't that person, that was a kid who struggled to sit still in one place all the time, stop fiddling around, stop getting up out of your chair, stop. If you're one of those kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so it, it's now saying, well, given all those reasons, would, what I never would have guessed that sitting down at a desk and doing writing would be something which would be part of my career. So given my struggles with all these things, you'd never guess that writing would become my passion, my career. I'm already interested in this person because they haven't just gone into pitching themselves. They've gone and said, look, I come from this background. I did this thing. And you know, despite that, now I'm in this place where I'm, I'm writing. So I'm, I'm, because I've been introduced to a cool story, I'm going, okay, I'm willing to read that little more. So let's go to the next bit, which is picking out the story where we talk about what some of those early struggles were. So yeah, you got that right. The, the, the girl that sits down now and writes all these tender applications and all these government um, documents now, once upon a time was a little girl who could not sit still. I was a kid who liked to play a lot. I liked to be outside. And the idea of sitting inside a classroom for hours on end was just completely useless for me. I was not that standard little girl who wanted to sit in the corner of the dollhouse. I was the girl who wanted to run out and play soccer and, and, and jump around in the sandpit and get muddy and get messy. But at some point, I now we go to the next level, I discovered words, I discovered books, I discovered there was this whole other world available to me. As a little kid, I couldn't really read, but as soon as I could read, by God, did I start reading. I discovered worlds of princes and princesses and 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 Wookiees and and and, and droids and, and Darth Vaders and then all these other books that were introducing me to concepts and worlds and places I'd never really dreamed of. I even discovered that that this book called um, 
around the bend by Neville Shute was this amazing epic story about a guy who basically upended his life in England and landed in in the middle of the desert in Egypt and set up this like this 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 airline that then brought in people from all over the place and gave birth to a massive religious movement and when I saw that the magic the books could create I wanted I wanted to make that too but the reality was that I was still just a teenager by this stage. I didn't have the chance to be able to write these stories. So what I did is I learned how to write. I learned, well, what, is, what does a writer do? How do they learn how to write? I started writing little stories and I'd share them with my friends and my family. And that became then people asking me to write their information about themselves. The next thing I knew, I was a 22-year-old um, and just fresh out of university. And all I wanted to do was write, but I didn't have a book in me. But I thought maybe I can help other people to find what they had to. And then we get that third part, which is turning that love of words into a job. I'm not a copywriter. I do some copywriting. I have done a lot of copywriting in my life. That's not my story. That's just me just guessing at someone else's story. It's always a process of, in those three points, having a bit of something to tell about the early struggles you had to become a copywriter, then discovering that you had a love of words or whatever it is for you. You had a, a, an epiphany moment. You might have been at university and realising that you're never going to want to be, you, 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 you were never going to be a lawyer because you couldn't stand the thought of being one. Or you had this moment where things changed and suddenly you had a love of something new. And then there was that process of how you turned that love of what you're doing into a job. So if you suddenly went from being, I don't know, let's just say someone who's working as a bricklayer and then you discovered um, that you wanted to become a wellness coach because you wanted to um, learn to help other people to live more fulfilling, more active and more healthy lives. At some point, you struggle with those things. At some point, you had your turnaround that you discovered this was your actual passion. And then you had that struggle to turn that into a job. That becomes a fascinating story for people to read. They don't just say, oh, yeah, he's a, he's a wellness coach or she's a copywriter. So, oh, yeah, I'll just, you know, maybe I'll book, but maybe I'll shop around too. They've had a chance to get to know you. I remember I said before, they have to know you before they can like you and they have to like you before they can trust you. They're not just going to trust you just simply because you showed up. So by explaining a little bit about yourself, telling a little bit about your story in a structured way that allows them to be able to get those, those pieces of not just the fact that you know what you're doing, but that you're a damn good person as well and with an interesting story. We love a person with a story. No one likes the guy at the pub who's always whinging and branching about the government, but they love the guy who's able to tell a good old yarn and have a bit of a story. We don't want to sit, go to a, to go to a camp when we're kids and, and hear um, stories around the campfire about how to balance our books and how to, um, how to become you know, more financially capable. We want to hear stories about monsters and ghosts and, and princes and princesses and dragons. That's what we want to hear around the campfire. Storytelling is a part of who we are as human beings. So now that we've got those three points together, and we started off by having that thought-provoking hook that bring us in. So we said, hey, given where I've come from, you'd never guess that I'll be doing what I'll be doing today. And here's the story about how that happened. You know, I had some early struggles, discovered a love of words, and now I've turned that into a job. Now we've actually got the right to be able to tell someone why they should look towards us, the right to ask them for the sale. And this is where... Now the getting out happens, that concluding thought and call to action. In this case, I've got, while the direction of our lives will take is not always clear, the message and purpose in your writing should always be. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just a lovely little twist at the end? You know, well, the direction of our lives, my, my life has gone in directions I never thought it would. Well, while the direction we take in life isn't always clear, the message and the purpose in our writing should always be. So get in touch today and let's talk about how words can bring your products and services to life. So we're tying it up. We've now earned the right to ask for the contact, for the, for the, for the sale, because they've now, they've, they know us. They have kind of liked us because of the story we told. And now they, tr they can trust us enough to click that book now button or ring that number or click on that, that form to fill out uh, an email to go to you. So that's essentially what the process is. So let's have a look at another example before we maybe look at one of yours. So the example could be that I want to write a bio about myself for a speaking opportunity because someone said, hey, we'd like you to speak at our conference. 
but we need a bio about you and a photo. So you got the photo, but you're going to go, oh, I don't have a bio. What do I write about? So we know that the reader is going to be someone who's looking for an interesting speaker. So if they're an interesting speaker, they're not going to be saying someone say as um, I speak on this subject, this subject, this subject, and I'm, a pro, I'm a professional and an expert in my field. It's going to be a bit more than that. It's going to have to be, again, they're going to have to get to know you and then be able to like you and be able to like you to trust you with their audience at the conference. So your structure needs to be very compelling, very interesting, and very convincing. So we might approach this this way. The, to write a bio about myself for speaking, I know that I need to stand out amongst the crowd because that person who's looking for interesting speakers for the conference has many choices um, and you're just one of them. Then the structure then would be that know you, like you, trust you. We need them to get to know us who we are. So they, they know us already because they've found us to actually ask us for that. Now they need to like us. So they're going to go, is this the person who I'm going to trust to my audience because they, are, they tell a great story and they're not just going to be a boring person who stands up on PowerPoint and just reads the words off the screen. They're going to bring this thing to life. So then we then add in the story. They get in, they tell the story, they get out. So again, that thought-provoking teaser, that three points that helps them to know, like, and trust you, and then a concluding thought and call to action. Now, each sort of industry and sort of way you're going to do this is going to vary slightly, but if you always have your in, your three points, and your out, it's going to make it so much easier for you to be able to talk about yourself. The get in in this case would be telling that beginning the story. After spending a decade studying to be a doctor, the last thing you'd expect is for him to use his skills to write radio ads and fill in for sick on-air persenses on the weekends. This, um, uh, spoiler alert, is my story. So after spending a decade studying to be a doctor, I ended up working in radio um, as a fill-in presenter and writing radio ads. So that's part of what I did. That's my story. And you go, wow, you studied to be a doctor and then you worked in radio? I'm already interested. This is an interesting story. I want to hear more. So three points of three ideas I'm going to enter into is telling the stories of my early struggles. So my early struggles would be um, that, that I studied in an area that I didn't really want to work in, but I persisted because, you know, it's medicine and who doesn't want to be a doctor if they got the marks? And I talk about that, but then I introduce what the positive outcome of that was. The positive outcome was that um, I used to watch a show called Frasier and I worked in psychiatric medicine. So um I wanted to, I had this dream as, as a little kid of being on the radio, um, but I got into medicine instead. So you got Frasier in that show is, is a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist who also is a radio presenter. And so I went, oh, maybe I could do that. Maybe that's what I really need to do. I always wanted to be a little radio star when I was a kid. So how do I sort of link the two of those to get? So I will then introduce what the positive outcome was. I was able to mix my, my love of psychology and the human mind to a way to be able to present to others and bring a little bit of joy to their lives, whether that's through writing an interesting ad, or whether that was able to, pronounce, to, to wake people up in the morning on their way to, uh, to school, to drop the kids off on their way to work, to take them away from the stress of their day and actually give them a little bit of cool stories on the way. And the positive outcome was that, that I went through a process it turned me from one thing, which was a failure as a doctor because I just hated what I was doing and had to and really wanted to get out, to a whole new career that I grew and all the people I met and the amazing things I had. In this case, though, I back it up with testimonials from others. So that's so I've got to get to know me for my early struggles, get to like me through the positive outcome and the hard work it took and the journey I took to change my career, and then finally we'll back up with what other people say about me. So how does that look? How does that actually feel? I'll start off with now. For anyone who feels like they peaked way too, oh, this is to get out, so I've gone right to the end. So at the end, I'm, I'm telling that, that story. So it's like for anyone who feels like they peaked way too early in life, this is a story jam-packed full of inspiration and, a, and it's never too late message. So you can book me now at dontasonjames.com. So as I'm getting out of my stories, I've gone and already done my no like trust now i'm getting to the end what do you do with all that now you know me you like me you trust me what do you do next i turn i turn it up and my whole story is basically a story of um peaking too early and not being able to follow through and reinventing myself so i've got an inspirational story to tell about you know if you if you think you peaked in high school it's okay because this story will help you to know that it's never too late to make a massive change in your life and what the call to action is, is book me now at this website. 
So these are a couple of examples that help you to do it. So before we go into some maybe some examples of what you're doing, and I might bring um, one of you on, if, you, if you'd like to actually participate um, live with me to come up with this story, because we've got time, um, please let me know in the chat window that you'd like to have a go. It'd be really cool to, to have a play with someone else's story. So the takeaways for this, it's hard to write about ourselves because we think it's self-absorbed and a bad thing. It's hard to write about ourselves because at some point we have to do it because of the mere exposure effect. And it's kind of awesome, almost forced upon us. The takeaway is there's several formulas for writing about yourself. This one's probably a really interesting one because it's, it's quite short and sharp and gives you a structure every time. So start with understanding what you want to do at the end of it, understanding who your reader is, and then picking a formula that suits them. Um, so you're, it's always going to be a three-parter, but it just depends on what the formula is, and it's going to be different for every person.